Okay, um, so good afternoon, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker for today, um, Professor Philip Clay of, the, of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, Phil was the former chancellor of the Institute from, uh, I believe, the year 2000 to the year 2000, and uh, I'm just gonna check the year. 11. 2011, 2000 to 2011. I got that one wrong. Um, and I got to know Phil in, I'd say around 2015, where we uh, were, Phil joined the scientific program committee of a initiative that I was helping to coordinate. And it was fascinating to see the depth of academic experience and the um, educational experience, the um, thinking around education and how to bring about transformation um, that Phil is not only it's clear not only from his time at MIT, but more in, in general. Um, Phil was also one of the founding board members of the MasterCard Foundation. He was also part of the Kresge Foundation board. Um, but as, a, as somebody who's devoted a lot of time to education um, in all parts of the world, um, Phil also spoke to the inaugurating class of 10 Academy in 2017. And I was, um, it was very, it was really nice to see how um how he captured the mood or the zeitgeist of the moment even though it was a new program so just from our brief discussions he understood very clearly what we were trying to do and what the students might be experiencing um so we spoke last week and uh phil is gratefully uh i'm very grateful that he's willing to speak to us today to all of the trainees here um we have about an hour but it's it's really an opportunity to ask questions, uh, to get to know him a little bit, but more to talk about what sort of impact could you make in your careers. Um, so his background is in housing policy, but um, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's he can meaningfully speak to um, all sorts of subjects, including AI, machine learning, and data science, as we're working on here. So Phil, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to uh, first congratulate you on having already reached the milestone of completing a college program uh, and having a degree and committing to a very important area of, of learning and a professional practice, namely machine learning, computer science, uh, data uh, science, et cetera. Uh, these will be critical topics in the future of your countries and the entire continent of Africa and beyond. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to work in some critical areas, and uh, my hope is that um, you will embrace this opportunity fully. Um, I want to start out also with uh, acknowledging the uh, work that Arun and his colleagues have done in creating uh, the program. Um, it's very difficult to create programs that are targeted uh, and that are, are able to target particular needs. That is, the need for young Africans or young Americans or young people in any country who will be the leaders of the future. Uh, we have no doubt about that. And our hope is that you not only have the appropriate education, but you have the appropriate understanding of the journey that you will take and how to take advantage of each step along the way. Um, I will say before I get into my, my main talk that I'm also involved in a program here in the United States that focuses on the last year young people are in college. Uh, these are young people, uh, people of color who and people who are first generation to college. And I uh, understand that some of you are the first in your family to go to college, to help them make the transition from the margins of society to the mainstream and to do it with confidence and clarity about your mission, your personal goals, and a sense of service uh, that many of you no doubt have. Uh, this is a critical step, and I'm happy to be a part of sharing it. Uh, so let me start out by saying a little bit about my 
journey. Uh, I was born in the South, in North Carolina. The South is the part of the United States that had originally uh, most of the slaves in the U.S., not, on, not the only place, but a vast concentration. And growing up in North Carolina, I saw the vestiges of slavery and its aftermath. Um, but one of the things that was important about slavery was the extent to which slave owners went out of their way to make sure the children of slaves did not learn to read or write. Now, as you can imagine, some of our forefathers and foremothers did learn to write. And so when the Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves uh, went into effect in 1865, Across the South, one of the first things that slaves did was to create a school. Even though very, very few of them could read or write, they knew that education was important and they created schools. Now the school that I graduated from, that is the high school that I graduated from, was one of these first schools. And white people as well as black people in the South did not know how to read and write. So the people who started the schools were the parents who said, we want a school and missionaries who said, we want to teach the freedmen. And so the school was established uh, and the seed of an excitement about education was planted and grew and grew to create one of the best schools in the country. So, uh, so across the South, education generally was poor, but almost every big city or big town had one school that had this spirit of education as liberation. And when the, whites who finally got the idea that maybe education was important, they created what were called industrial schools. That is, they wanted to teach freedmen how to plant, cook, sew, put horseshoes on horses, etc. Not mathematics, not literature, not science. Because as you well appreciate, once you learn those subjects, then you begin to think for yourself. And the industrial school was not intended to be a school where the students would think for themselves because thinking was dangerous if you wanted to create a society where blacks and whites are separate. But the secret was that in these original academies, and that's what they, some of them were called academies, there was a sneaky program aimed at true education. And some of these evolved into colleges so that there is a system of historically black colleges and universities across the South. That is how the seed of education seeds were planted and how they matured. And some of those schools still exist. Some of the colleges still exist. You may have heard of Howard University Morehouse College, Spelman College, Tuskegee, Hampton, etc. Those were the schools that emerged out of this period. And but for what they did, our ability to emerge successfully out of slavery would have been hampered. Now, I remember the school, the first school that uh, was sort of the old school. The old school was a building that had four rooms and a big hallway. One room for cooking, one room for sewing, one room for uh, and so forth and so on. But when I grew up, when I went to school as a first grader in 1952, we had the first modern schools. But the spirit of the, of the original academy persisted against efforts to essentially uh, dampen or discourage education. Happily, I grew up in a community where that did not, that effort did not succeed. I had an education that was 
college preparatory, much as many of you have had. I was taught Latin and mathematics and chemistry and biology and all of the subjects that made it possible for me to go to the university. Uh, and I went to the University of North Carolina as one of 10 black students in a class of 200, I mean, of 2,500 students. So education was presented to me as a challenge, but an important challenge to embrace, even though in those days it was difficult. Uh, and I succeeded, would go on and get a PhD in city planning and become a professor of city planning. Now, the secret I kept from lots of people, in fact, everybody except those who knew me very well, I became a city, a professor of city planning before I had ever lived in a real city. And I was teaching things that I certainly knew about based on reading, but I didn't know about from my lived experience. So I had to take a leap, a leap of going from this rural South to big universities outside the South. I had to take a leap from being a shy kid who didn't want to sort of stand out to someone who was told by a teacher when I was about 15 that you have something to offer the world so you can't hide under a basket. And that teacher basically pulled me out of the sort of my shyness into um, a more assertive person. Now I'm still shy. I wake up every morning saying I can't be shy today. That allows me to hold on to my uh, identity even as I have a, a public persona of, of being not very shy at all. Sometimes that's necessary because you don't necessarily have control over the habits you develop as a young person, habits that might have been okay then, but don't serve you well as you make the journey into adult life and professional life. Now, I had one other asset at that time. I was never, and I'm still not a big fan of reading novels, but I love reading history and I love reading about people in history. And one of the first people I read about was uh, named Ralph Bunch. Now, Ralph Bunch was probably uh, a mature adult by the time I read his story. Uh, and his story parallels many of the steps that I have taken. So I tried to get learn as much about him as I could. And I tried to use the insight I got from his experience to inform my approach to growing up not from starting in high school, but going all the way through uh, college and early professional life. He would go on to be a famous professor as well. Uh, and he became, when the United Nations was established, the first uh, undersecretary general of the UN. So he had a very public career and I followed him all the way through his life and read a couple of books about his life uh, and said, <clears throat> if Ralph Bunch can do it, so can I. Now, I want you, I'm going to now talk about some things that I learned along the way. And I hope as I go through this, you will think of some questions that uh, come to mind. Uh, and I hope you won't be shy about it because at some point in an hour or so from now, I will disappear. So before I disappear, I hope you'll ask your questions. And if you want to be in touch with me when you think of a question, you know, tomorrow, the next day or next month, um, Arun can give you my email address and I'll be happy to communicate with you later. So let's talk about some of the critical things that I learned over the years. Some of these things I learned early and some of them I learned later. So the first 
item I want to introduce you to is the notion of vision. That is having a view of something that you would like to achieve or be a part of achieving, but doesn't exist now. It may not even be what people now think is possible, but you have this vision. And for me, it's been a guiding principle. So let me give you the first example of vision. Uh, the college I went to was in North Carolina in the US South. And the South was the, the least developed part of the country, high concentration of poverty. And the university I went to was one one location of great education. So I went to a meeting that a group of businessmen called to talk about their vision for making North Carolina a leading area for economic development. So I, there I was with a, a half a dozen other uh, students, uh, uh, college seniors, and I listened to these men talk about what they imagined. And they said, we imagine that this area, call it the research triangle, this area will become a magnet for major companies and laboratories to come to the South to take advantage of all of the excellent young people we are preparing at the highest level. We want pharmaceutical companies, computer companies, we want industrial research and development activities to come to this place. Now this place was a thousand acres of woods. And they were saying they were going to create something that will make all of those economic players move to North Carolina. And I said, wow, can they really do this? And the answer was yes. Over the next 15 years, what they said happened. And as I read later, I understood how they made it happen. That's vision. So let me tell you how I use that lesson, at least a little bit of it that I understood uh, at that time. As I indicated, I was one of a dozen black students in the class of 2,500. So a group of the black students went, and I went to visit the chancellor of the university to tell him that we thought there should be more black students at the university. We did that and they say, yeah, 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 but you know, times are tough and you know, there are black schools for black students to go to. Well, of course we weren't happy with that answer uh, and we got it two or three times. And then I said, you know, if we had the addresses of the schools, like the one that we graduated from, that is the school I described that I went to and that other black students who made it into the university. If we could get the addresses of the guidance counselors at those schools, if we could go out to those schools and ask them to let us talk to their students and tell them what a wonderful education they could get at the University of North Carolina, then they will come. There were no legal barriers at this time against their coming. You only had to apply. And if you met certain criteria, you would be admitted. So I told that to a couple of people. And one person said, the Dean of Admissions is on your side, but he can't do anything because he would be fired. But he's willing to help you if you arrange to bump into him. That is, you can't make an appointment to go see him. You can't call him on the phone. You just have to bump into him and tell him what you want. And then indirectly, he would get that to you. They told us where his office was and they told me where he taught because he taught history. So I arranged to bump into him two or three times. And he said, yeah, I, I can do that. And sure enough, we got the list. And then I said to other students who shared my vision that we need to get on the road to talk to these students. We need some money. We need access to a car. 
We need to make some phone calls. We need to do other things that cost money. And then I magically, money started to appear. <clears throat> I went to the Y and they said, we'll be your fiscal agent. That is, you know, they won't write the check to me. So we had a place that we could go. We could then rented a car and we ran a, went around the state having written letters or made phone calls to these guidance counselors to ask them to let us meet students they thought were prepared for the university uh, and who might listen to our message. But the next year, the number of black students tripled. Well, I graduated by this time and one of the young men working with me took over the program and he ran it for a year. Then another one took over and ran it for a year. And by this time, the university got the message and said, I guess we should let black students in. We should tell them that they're welcome. And the numbers doubled each year for several years. Not reaching, uh, it has to double many times to get to a decent percentage. Uh, but that was an example of what vision meant for me. Now, I would see vision many times in my career. But what this experience, starting back with the triangle part, was that if you can imagine something, if you can think through the steps that might be required, you don't have to think of all of the steps, just some of them, and share that with other people who can give you advice and assistance, then you can move mountains. You can get rid of a president. So I maybe shouldn't be telling that to you guys. But one of the things that also happened while I was doing my work was, and this was during the Vietnam War, there are a group of students who said, we need to prevent the president from running for re-election. And I went to some of these meetings. I said, really? You, you guys are going, you sophomores and juniors in college are going to prevent the president from running for re-election. Well, sure enough, over a period of nine months, students around the country made the case to each other and to others that this president should not be reelected. And they came up with a candidate who ran against the president in the primary. The president won the primary, but the other candidate got 30% of the vote. And there was an escalation of demand for the president to step aside. And sure enough, the president said, in March of this year, after this campaign that started in July, before, that I will not run for re-election. Now, that was only the first step in a vision. We didn't get a president who was any better, but at least we demonstrated that by envisioning a process and executing it, you can, in fact, make change. Now, you all are in subject matters that focus on engineering and science and math. Uh, and you should not assume that somehow there's not a chance there to have similar impact. The students who are majoring in government or economics won't have any uh, better chance than you of having high impact on the visions that you create. In fact, as the world becomes more technologically sophisticated, you may actually have more influence than they have because you're able to use tools of artificial learning, machine learning. You're able to do analysis of data that will be very powerful in bringing about the change you want to see. And the change you want to see need not be esoteric. You don't have to focus on getting rid of the president or turning a wooded area into an industrial park. It can be something as simple as working with people like yourselves to create educational programs in institutions that exist that are not working very well. Because there you have an opportunity to take something that's not working very well and make it work very, very well. But I won't lecture, you'll have plenty of things that you will develop 
a vision about. Now, I can imagine some of you, as I remember being at your stage in my life, a bit um, reticent to step out and do things that you are uncomfortable with. All I can say about that is that you won't become more comfortable standing in the shadow. You'll have to step out, let people know what you can do, what you believe, what you're passionate about, and you'll be surprised at how comfortable you become because you are affirmed in that stepping forward. Not very many people, young people or people of any age are willing to step outside of their, of their comfort zone. It's comfortable to be in your comfort zone. But you get uncomfortable when you see something that ought to be better. You have a vision of something that would be better than what exists presently. Or you see a problem that ought to be solved because you know what the solution is. Your obligation then is to step out and to support others like yourselves who have an idea about how to make your world better. There are also temptations along the way. I remember at one point when I was early in my PhD program, I had just um, married um, and, you know, didn't have much money, but I had enough. Somebody came along and offered me a very good job. I had a college degree. Uh, I didn't have much money and I was on this journey to get a PhD. Uh, and someone offered me a very good job making very good money. It took me about three seconds to say no thank you. I said no thank you because one, the job, while it paid, while it paid well, while it sounded good, it was not a job that fit the pattern of life or the goal that I had for myself. So I turned it down in the belief that what I was aiming to do was better than this job. And that taking that job would have been a distraction, maybe a permanent distraction. So my advice there is to stick with your vision. But my vision, my advice is also to not believe that you have to be alone, that there are other people who share your vision and working with them uh, multiplies the impact uh, that you can possibly have. Now, I want to sort of wrap up with a few rather specific things. The first is be a constant learner. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you may be a bit tired of school and can't imagine going back. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that you go back now necessarily, but I would suggest this, that when you get in a job, it may be a very good job, it may be a job that everybody is um, jealous that you have such a great job. But when you take that job, Try to ask discreetly, where are the people who had this job five years ago? That will give you insight in what job that job can do for you. If you find that the people who had that job five years ago are right down the hall with the same job, that may send a message to you that perhaps this job doesn't lead anywhere. If you find out that the people who had this job five years ago have all moved up or on, you have to then ask well, where, whether that's what you would like to be your situation five years from now. The other is to go to the students, uh, to your classmates in school, keep in touch with them, 
and share your experience. They share uh, their experience and you learn from each other how things are going. What they've learned about the places they are, share with them what you've learned about the places you are, and then have some basis for judging whether you are on a good trajectory. Because there are good trajectories and there are bad trajectories. And you don't want to be on a bad one. A bad one is basically where you do the same thing without any additional scope of work, any additional responsibility, or any exposure to how to apply your skills and knowledge for wider impact for yourself and for your profession. A good job today is not will not necessarily be a good job three to five years from now. I had one job between the time I received my degree and retirement. One job. It was a great job. Uh, but the possibility for your generation to stay in one position 30 or 40 years is not too great. So embrace the probability that you will have to zigzag your way up in the world and in the profession. You take a good job now and you are constantly looking at how I can do better either in this job or in some other job. It's not a bad thing to show ambition. You have to be diplomatic about it, but saying to your boss that I want your job is a compliment. They may not take it that way, and I'm not advising you to actually do that, but you should let them know that you are a person who expects to have an impact in the world. You want to use the knowledge you have. You want to gain new knowledge and that you are ambitious. Saying that to your boss, even tomorrow, is not a bad thing. Some bosses may be a little surprised, but any boss who is hostile to that is not gonna be doing you any favors there's a better than even chance that they'll want to help you because helping you helps them. They know you're going to leave sometime and they would like their job, their organization to be known as a good place to be from as well as a good place to be at. So let your light shine so others can see it. Another point I want to suggest is that you will be tempted. Uh, you'll be tempted, and in those temptations, you should remain true to your values and true to a sense of integrity that will be a major asset as you advance in your career. Now, you know as well as I know that there are some people who will do anything for a buck or anything for an advantage that they do not have not earned. You don't want to be one of those people, even though you may be tempted. You don't want to be a tool of somebody else's dishonesty or ambition undeserved or unfocused. So I would advise you to maintain your sense of value and purpose and to always act with, inter with uh, integrity and let that be known. You don't have to brag about, gee, I'm an honest person, but your colleagues will be watching you and they will be looking at, well, what are this guy's or this woman's strengths? What are their weaknesses? You want them to see your uh, strengths and one of them is honesty and of course, loyalty and sense of value, et cetera. You want them to know that the ones who have evil intentions or corrupt intentions probably won't bother you because they know that you won't go along with whatever their scheme is. Finally, 
I want to suggest that you consider yourself and that you act as part of a larger community. One does not need to go through the journey of life alone. Some of you, I'm sure, have already learned this. And in that case, I hope you'll reinforce it to others. But if you somehow think you can make it by yourself, let me suggest that that's really not possible. And it should not be desirable. There will be difficult days, hard days, and you should have someone to share that with, someone who can give you advice. And there is such a thing as a competent friend as well as an incompetent friend. So maybe your incompetent friends are good for something else, but they may not be the guiding lights, the sounding boards that you will need. But you will want to have good friends, honest friends with whom you can share the journey uh, and share that for a long period of time. I still have probably 10, 15 guys from high school and a similar number from college who are still part of my personal network. My high school class, those of us who are still alive, we are class of 1964. There are 75 alive out of 250 who still gather virtually, of course, since we're all in different places to share experiences. There's a similar group from college. Those 11 guys who were in my class, we were called the BBC, the Black Boys of Carolina. And we've kept up with each other for the last 55 years. Uh, we've helped each other. We've advised each other. We've warned each other. And that is something I value, even though at our age, it's now mostly going to our children's weddings or uh, family funerals. But they have been a source of great strength throughout my life. Uh, and I can't imagine having gone all these years without having someone who reminded me of things that I may have forgotten or who will tell me honestly, that's a stupid idea or who will help me understand an opportunity that I, that I don't see. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I look forward to answering some of your questions. All right, thank you so much, Phil. Um, we'll go straight into questions. If anyone has a question, you can either virtually raise your hand or you can also type your question in the chat box. And while we're waiting for, uh, Michael, okay, Michael, go ahead. If you can turn your video on, that would be lovely if you're in a position. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Phil. Uh, when um, he was speaking, he made mention of getting in touch with um, your colleagues. Um, I, I might not know um, the kind of culture he grew in, he grew in from, but um, most of the times, the, what we have at our end is kind of that sort of um, competition or sort of between um, colleagues. So instead of um, colleagues to get together, probably when you are keeping in touch with them, um, what's going on at your end and all that, people might think you are trying to um, be kind of um, following them, trying to compare their successes to yours. I want to find out. Um, from him, if he well, when he started to get in touch more with his colleagues, if he experienced that and how he was able to deal with that, because most of the times there are people who who think that way, and you can win them actually to your side, and it can they can bring a lot of successes in your life. So I, I wanted to find out how he, if he experienced it, how. Okay, you're muted, but I think I have your question. Uh, and if I don't, uh, let me know and I'll try again. Um, there's several pieces to your question. I think one, uh, I picked up the word competition. And I, I can tell you that the amount of real competition um, 
in my experience, is fairly minimal. And uh, 40 years of being a professor, I never decided to ration high grades. If everybody in the class made an A, everybody got an A. I didn't try to figure out who I could force the, a B. Now, what I also did was I say, if everybody made an A, this exam is too easy. And the next one will be a bit more difficult. But I think more, most people are comfortable cooperating, but you're probably at an age where that's not fully recognized yet. You may believe that really sometimes there are only a few opportunities and if you don't get it, somebody else will. The truth is that there are many more opportunities and you will get farther if you share information with each other than if you try to protect information, figuring that I'm not going to let my buddy know about this job because I want to get it. Um, I know that sounds a bit simplistic, but there are a lot of good jobs. Uh, and you will get farther sharing the information and, and, and being a part of a group that's willing to share than uh, trying to somehow move on your own to be successful, thinking that you're being successful at the expense of your friends. Uh, that probably is not true. Now, let me give you another way of looking at that. Sometimes the competition is over uh, possessions. Uh, one person has a, Vol a Volkswagen and another person has a Mercedes. Now, the truth is they'll both get you to the same destination at the same time. So if expending resources for the Mercedes keeps you from investing the money in something that will get you an additional benefit, then don't spend the money on the Mercedes, spend it on the Volkswagen and maybe get a Mercedes later. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that cooperation uh, is much better, that we are part of a larger team uh, and um, we should operate that way. And it works in sports as well. You don't want your competition to be the trip and fall. You want them to stand up straight, play the game, and let the best person win. Okay? That's true in lots of things in life. You want to be part of a, of a community, an organization, a company that is going strong, which means you want to do everything you can for the, for the joint enterprise to be successful because that gives you the best chance of being part of something successful. You don't want to hold back weakening the effort and then being successful in something that's less well off. The smart person in that organization would quit and go work for another organization. Not stay around and try to hoard their assets. Is that helpful? Are there any other questions? You can raise your hand. Kevin? Um, hey, I'm not in a position yeah, to share my video. That's, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I must say, uh, um, um, try, you're breaking up. I'm not hearing the question. Michael, maybe turn your video off. The connection's a bit slow. Okay, sorry, Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. No, I'm okay. Sure. Um, I'm I'm not in a position to share my video. I don't use. I don't. You guys see my messy room. Um, That's all so, right. <laughs> um, my question is right. about vision, and um, you did say if you can envision something and the process on um, to acquire that particular thing, um, you should really do it, and you should make the steps to go through and follow your vision. So my question is. I'm sure yes. in, in your particular long career, you've had visions that um, didn't come through and some that failed along the way. Uh, so my question is, how do you overcome that particular fear of following your yep. vision 
and how do you deal with the situation if your particular vision or the vision that you had doesn't come to fruition or doesn't go the way you expected it to be? There may be some truth. That's a very good question. Very good question. Thank you. It reminds me of something I should have said about it. Uh, because you have a vision doesn't mean that you leap forward and do it. It may take you some time to build and get the knowledge, to build the resources, to put a team together to get insight, uh, to get insight from a variety of sources, so that uh, you have a, a chance of being successful. Um, so let me give you an example from uh, Nairobi. Um, I came to I came to Nairobi um, uh, in part of, in in connection with my Mastercard work, and this was about 2016, I think. Uh, and I visited a um, uh, cur, cur, uh, cur, um, a Salaj Carib. Uh, Okay, I'll just, I can't think of the name of the, the neighborhood, but somebody had, and this was a very poor area and um, lots of dense, dense crowding. Um, and the, somebody had the idea that they should build housing so that the, it, it not, it, not housing for everybody, but to get a start on creating a, a new community adjacent to this uh, community that I visited, uh, where everyone would have housing, rooms, running water, play space for the kids, et cetera. So someone built, you know, got the money together, built the housing, and it was very attractive, but empty. And the reason it was empty was because whoever designed it didn't understand how the people who would occupy the housing actually lived. The people who actually lived in that area, for them, where they lived and where they worked were the same. And they gave me the example of, and I saw lots of people who sold charcoal, uh, tiny bags of charcoal. Now, one of the rules in this new housing was you could not have uh, commercial products or charcoal or fuel oil or kerosene or any products. This housing was only to be for living. Well, that was a bad design mistake. The vision didn't include that you had to have a place to live and work in order to serve these people. Just providing them housing meant that they would admire the housing, but they wouldn't live in it because they had to live where they could sell their coal. A better idea would have been to have the housing and then to have an adjacent area that was commercial so that you provided a place to live and a small place to have your shop, okay? So you have to think about all of these things. You don't just have a vision and think that whatever idea pops in your head is a perfect idea. It's an idea that needs to go through a lot of thinking and planning and analysis and developing cooperation so that others share the vision, bring their ideas and bring their resources so that you have a successful outcome. Who would like to go next? Any other questions? I have a, I have a number of questions um, that I want to. Any uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, before you go, um, can I just uh, add add another bit to that? The same question. They're related. Um, of course, um, having a vision and um, following that particular thing and getting to do that um, takes some level of risks. And I'm sure there is some doubts in that particular scenario when you're going to take your vision and such. Um, are there any tools or any things in your portfolio that you do uh, to sort of curb the doubts and maybe deal with that particular situation? A very good question. Uh, risk and uh, doubt uh, are um, realities of life. 
So anything that is worth doing will involve some risk. Uh, sometimes there are risks to you. Sometimes there are risks to the people you're trying to help. Sometimes it's a risk for the larger community. So you do have to weigh the risk. And I like to phrase a calculated risk. That is, you try to understand what you're risking and try to minimize it or eliminate it. You don't ignore it because you can, in fact, do great harm. And you don't want to create something, pull somebody away from what is secure, but perhaps very um, inadequate, but it's secure, and bring them to something which is quote unquote nice, but risky or dangerous. Uh, if you're trying to help someone, make sure they understand what it is and they are willing to share the risk or help you minimize the risk. Now, doubt is, a di is more difficult because doubt is in your mind. Risk is a reality of the world. Doubt is in your mind. And I think the way to uh, conquer doubt is to consult with people whose judgment you trust. They will help you, and assuming they know you well, they will help you conquer your doubt. They may even help you so that you will have a partner rather than be undertaking something alone. But there's no way to deal with it other than to, to face the doubt. Don't submerge the doubt because what you will be doing is submerging facts, which are important to take into account. Thank you. So while we're waiting for anyone else who has a question, um, one question I had for you, Phil, is how, in my experience, I think the productive periods in my life have been those where I have a support system around me that enables me to reach my goal. Um, I wonder if you could share some experiences that you have on how do you how have you created that support system around you to allow you to reach your vision? A uh, very good question, and I think um, I've always had people around me who who knew me first of all. Uh, and that's important so that you basically have to have friends, colleagues, relatives who know you and will support you and will tell you what they think of your idea, where you might get help, whether they can help you or know people who can help you. And I find as a father, now this is putting on a different hat as well as someone who has taught young people your age for many years, there is a period of life where you think you don't really need help, that your, your idea is sufficiently mature and cooked and that you can just do this. Uh, and sometimes you're right, but sometimes you're wrong. And you can minimize the risk of making a, a pursuing an unproductive path by having people around you who, who you can approach. Now, sometimes they can only give you moral support, but you'd be surprised at how smart people are who have no education. You explain something to them, and if any of it is within their reality, they can ask you probing questions, like how are you going to do that? How are you going to compensate for the fact that you don't have any money or land or some other asset that you need. They'll ask you that question. You may think, well, gee, I can go to the bank and get a loan. And they'll tell you, no, you can't go to the bank and get a loan. The bank won't give you a loan. So you just have to create a network of people that you can approach. And you will eventually get find people who, if they're convinced that you can be an instrument for change, they will invest in you. They will show you things that you can't see. They will have you have people connect to you who you don't know or vice versa. Uh, they can basically give you a place for security for time for the time being. I have, and people have helped me say, um, 
you need some time to work on this. So I'm going to support you for a period of time while you get this idea to the next stage. That's good. That means I can devote my full time. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to pay my rent. I have time to talk to people and build a team. Uh, that's, I think, the way you uh, get yourself in a good position. Any questions? So please just virtually raise your hand. Halsey? Yes, thank you very much, Arun. And uh, I would like just to give a wow to Mr. Philip. It's like your ritual we used to do at an academy when they did a good presentation, telling a wow. I've just, uh, um, <laughs> just two things have marked me in what you just say, uh, Professor Phillips. Is the first of all is the doing doing the education uh, uh, like making the education our challenge. This is uh, I think I will join that uh, that idea, making the education uh, our challenge. And the second thing is also telling to our boss, like, uh, I, I forgot, like, the way you say that, tell, you have to tell to your boss, like, uh, uh, your position, uh, I, I would like to have it. Like me telling to Harun, tomorrow I would like to be the manager of 10 Academy. <laughs> it will be, it's, a, it's an ambition and dream, but it's something that I think if we, we we fix the education problem in Africa. I think it will be a good thing for us, and that is the job that you and Harun you are doing. So we we are still young, and we want you to give us more advice and more tips and methods or blueprints of how we can improve our African educational system. It will be the 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 the. the the only power or the only weapon we will have to, to fight for tomorrow. So thank you very much for your presentation, Mr. Philip. I don't have a question. It was just giving my point of view. I really love what you are doing. And please go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that. And um, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, when you're at your age, you are looking for opportunity and you think of, gee, getting a job is hard. Uh, or getting the kind of job I want may be difficult or it may take some time. The truth is that people who have jobs are always looking for talent. In every organization I've been in, at some point, sometimes several times a year, there is a meeting at which the question is, which one of these people can we move forward? Who's the leader? Who's creative? who is magnetic, that is people want, they want to be near you, who has good ideas. And all the time, the people you work for are looking. And at some point during the year, they will say, uh, I like the way he, she, he or she thinks. I like, they have, they have good ideas or, they have follow through. Follow through is a big thing. You can, it's one thing to have an idea. It's an altogether different and far more important thing for you to follow up on your idea. Lots of people will get something and then sit expecting that progress will happen magically. When of course it won't. Uh, so don't worry that if you present that you're ambitious, that somehow that's going to turn people off. They will turn some people off, but those are people you don't have to worry too much about anyway. It will be noticed and somebody will say, I'm going to give you a task to do. And then I'm going to watch how you do it. I'm going to see if you ask for help. I'm going to see if you use the resources. I'm going to see if you follow through. I'm going to see how other people relate to you. And if there are good answers to all of those questions, you're on your way. Chikinda? 
Oh, hi, Professor. How are you? How are uh, you uh, I have one question. You said something about saying no. Uh, and uh, personally, I've been struggling with saying no. And uh, I've, when I'm uh, presented with uh, some situations where I can get some money out of it, uh, I always tend to try and uh, juggle between what I'm after and actually trying to get that little money from this other side. But uh, my question is, so sometimes I have the what ifs in my mind and I'm like, uh, what if I lose what I'm actually supposed to be doing at the expense of chasing this small amount of money? And uh, honestly, for the times that I've been facing that problem, I've actually fallen on the safer side that I didn't lose what I was chasing. But what keeps you uh, saying to, act to actually uh, say no and it's a no and uh, not looking back completely, even if you really need that money at that time? Uh, it's a very good question. And I've certainly been in a situation many times when I was at the, your age. I don't know exactly how old you are, but roughly your I'm age. 23. <laughs> OK, mid-20s. Um, I think The big picture is that you want to be grounded. That is, you will be, you know, the wind will be blowing in different directions. There'll be quicksand under your feet that you think you're sinking. There'll be opportunities to reach up, to reach around. You want to figure out how you can get in a position where you don't have to worry about survival. Because if you're not in that position, then if somebody comes along and offer you a distracting task, just where you only interested in the money, then you will be, then there's a risk that you will be permanently distracted. I'm not saying don't ever, you know, go for the small amount of money you can get and that you may need. But I've had too many students who are moving along in their educational program. And then somebody comes along and offers them what looks like a great opportunity, which they say they will take for a month or a year, only to be sucked off and not complete their education. Um, my advice is to resist that. And I can remember in my, and I know sometimes the issue is not just you, it's a family matter. Where the family expects that if you can make money, that you will make money and help the family, help your younger brothers or sisters. It's a temptation to always go on that route, but the risk is that you won't get back to the point where you could help them even more. Many students who come from Africa to the U.S. face that problem big time. I remember sitting with a young man who had a computer science degree from MIT, and his father came for graduation. And I asked the young man whether he would be going back to Uganda. Uh, and he dropped his head and said, no, I'm not going back. I have a job in California. His father and the job in California was a very good job. He would start out making $150,000 a year. And I asked him later, what's the best job he could get in Kampala in Uganda? He said, there are one or two jobs, one or two places where I might get a job making 40,000. He was in a bind because he wanted to help his family. His father was sitting right there beside him. And he had a choice between a $150,000 job, which if he didn't like, he could call an Uber and go down the street and get another job. Maybe a job making even more. Or the job in Kampala, which paid a lot less and if he didn't like that job, he really did not have another choice in Kampala. 
or maybe you had one choice, or maybe the choice wasn't timely. So you will face these issues, and I think you have to make a tough decision. I can't say whether it's better to take the money and help your family or stick to your plan so that you will be in a better position two, three, five, ten years from that time. Occasionally, you can do both, but generally not. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Now, now let me suggest one other thing, because some of you will be working for Western companies, for American companies. And those companies understand this issue, and some of them actually do try to accommodate. For example, they will hire you to work in Nairobi but they'll send you to London for a year. Now, you'll be paid a lot more when you go to London for the year. And they'll expect you to come back to Nairobi. So that's one way some companies accommodate. Some companies will also send you for an advanced degree. Let's say you're in computer science and you're really into data science in a way that is very powerful for the company. The company might send you to Europe or send you to the U.S. to complete your degree or to get a new degree. And they will put handcuffs on you to make sure you come back. But in doing that, you're able to advance your education, make more money, and help your family. So I don't want to say it's impossible to sort of combine these different um, ambitions or needs. It is, but it has to be worked out. <clears throat> Should we finish up with one last question? Who wants to ask the last question? <laughs> so Michael's already asked a question. I want to give someone else an opportunity. If there isn't anyone else, we'll go, we'll go with Michael. <laughs> go ahead, but Michael. You're muted, think, Michael. Yeah, my my question is kind of a follow up to what um Jakenda asked. The dynamics at the at the at our end here is um, well, when you are kind of doing your undergrad, you know you are living with your parents, and then kind of they are taking care of you. It is expected of yeah. you right after your undergrad that you begin to take care of yourself. Sometimes you also start a family on your own. The issue we yep. face most of the time is, first of all, even when you are getting into um, any other opportunity, you have to ask yourself that, would you get enough on the table for the family and for yourself? That is one difficult thing that our, our end, the people at our end we face, because there isn't a lot of opportunities as to you are not you don't have a lot of choices where you could say, okay, you would go through a stack of them and then you still know that a lot of them will come your way. Um, the follow-up question is, in situations like this, where um, you've gotten into a team and then you, you are, you, it's just uh, difficult, you don't know what lies next. When you are taking such a risk, you probably have to take a risk, but what are some of the things the, the the very important things the underlining things to ensure that even as you take those risks you wouldn't move away from your vision well <clears throat> the vision can be a long-term vision uh, because you have the vision today doesn't mean you can achieve it tomorrow i think part of the envisioning process is to in fact give serious thought to how you would actually achieve the vision, uh, the vision and what are the steps you take in order for that success to be, um, to be assured. Uh, so that's, I think that's the short answer to your question. Uh, develop a plan and then uh, try to stick to that plan, especially avoid anything that would take you away from um, 
that vision. And sometimes you can do wonderful things uh, in the meantime. For example, um, some of you might want to feel obligated to share what you know, what you've learned with others in your community or in your city. Well, if you have a few hours a week, you can volunteer at a school, you can volunteer in some uh, social organization to help young people. It, it only takes a few hours of your time. Uh, you still can work at your job. You can still uh, you know, have family life and personal life, but the few hours you spend with the young people would be a very serious way of keeping your vision alive for something in the future related to education or work. It will also be evidence to um, uh, older people who watch you that uh, you are a serious person and you are committed to helping the community and that you are trying to do what you can in the time that you have. They understand that you don't, you're not going to, you know, spend all of your time on something, but that you have some time to share. So do what you can, even if that's not enough. Plan so that you can make steady progress on your vision, which you know, some things will take a long time, even if money were not the issue. It takes convincing other people to do things, uh, and it takes a, a favorable environment for change. Uh, so I'm a big fan of vision, but sometimes vision uh, unfolds, will unfold very slowly. So we have a question from one of the women in the group. Uh, she wants to ask, Bethlehem asks, what motivates you to do more? What keeps you going in hard times? Well, um, I've given my uh, professional life to education and to helping young people. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, if any of you want to be professors, uh, it's a great job. Uh, if you're in the right place. Now, I know some professional positions are better than others, uh, but the benefit you get is from seeing young people make that those first critical steps on their own life journey uh, and to be a part of that. I think back of students I've taught and the wonderful things they're doing five, 10, 20 years after I taught them. And I take some credit for it, even though I may not deserve all of the credit that I'm claiming. Now, when hard times come, there are different kinds of hard times. There are the hard times that I experienced personally. Uh, there are hard times that others experience that I'm a part of. And then there's the kind of global hard times like we're in with the pandemic. I think the easy answer, the short answer is that I look for the silver lining. I look for a way of doing something positive, even if I'm presented with obstacles uh, and barriers to uh, sort of keeping on the track I want uh, and for everything to work out nicely. Uh, the other thing is that I've always found that there are people who want to be helpful. There are angels who appear. Uh, and you just have to step out and show yourself deserving of the angel's grace. So there's another question, I'm just trying to understand the exact wording, but in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask if you had any lessons to share on humility. Uh, yes. Um, When you're successful, when you're skilled, um, when you have knowledge, there's the tendency to want to um, express that, uh, to show that you can run the fastest, you, that you can solve the problem the quickest, that you know more than anybody else in the room. Uh, even though there have been times when I knew more than anybody else in the room, I also knew that every person in that room knew something I didn't know that was valuable. 
Uh, I also know that sometimes you're in a room where everybody's smart. And the issue isn't who's the smartest person in the room, but who can make something happen that the people in that room want to happen. Um, I'm not comfortable bragging. I was told as a kid that that's a bad thing to do. You don't brag. Uh, and I guess I take the view that if you can let your light shine, other people will give you credit for sharing the light. Svench, do you want to ask your question? I, I don't really understand the question that you typed. Do you want to unmute and just ask your question, Svench? Is she still here? Yeah. Svench? Into public relations. Okay. I, sorry, Smith, I still don't understand the question. Are you able to unmute? So Smith is asking what got you into public relations for the first time? Um, I wouldn't say I'm in public relations. I mean, my education is city planning and my uh, profession is education, uh, and outside of education, I've been involved in a lot of activities, which I would more, uh, I would characterize as public affairs or policy rather than communication. Actually, what got me involved was, um, um, it's so long ago, I'm 75. So whatever decision I made, I made a long time ago. But I think what is at the core is a, uh, a desire to serve. Education and other things I've done are the ultimate in service. Uh, and I became interested in how I could help young people on the journey. Uh, and in my case, at the college level, but other people can make the same decision for elementary and secondary education. I get tremendous uh, benefit from seeing uh, people learn, whether they're 21 or 61. Are there any last questions? Or 71. <laughs> or 81, maybe. Anyone. In fact, uh, as a grandfather, I've enjoyed watching you know, uh, uh, sort of a, a bundle of curiosity emerge into a lively learning individual. Any last questions from the group? Okay. Um, well, Phil, thank you uh, very much. You, you use the word um, that when you are looking for something, when you have a need, then sometimes an angel will emerge and help you out. Um, <clears throat> and from your part of the East Coast of the United States to me here in Europe and others across the continent, it's we're right in the middle of our training program. And I think that at times it feels like um, it's difficult. We're trying to learn a lot. We're trying to do a lot. Um, but your, your wisdom and your gentleness, I can speak for myself, has been very, um, it's been very refreshing. And the perspective that it brings and the simplicity, the simple message, but the wisdom behind it is um, it's very timely and appreciated. So thank you. Um, we look forward to having you um, finding other ways for you to continue to spread this message. But I'll, I'll leave the last word to you. Well, thank you all very much. I've enjoyed this. I consider it an honor to share in your exploration and your journey uh, and uh, you're in the right field you're in the right place to make an impact and i wish you every success personal and professional so i just before everyone we log off i'd love to take a picture so if everyone who if you can just turn your camera on even if your hair isn't done or you, kevin if your room is a bit messy just get right up in front of the camera
and nobody's going to be looking at your dirty socks behind you, Kevin. Yeah. So if we can just get everyone to turn their videos on, that would be great. People are turning on, great. Always interesting to see. Okay, here they come. Kevin's room looks lovely. I'm not sure what he was saying. <laughs> My left is standing there with a banana behind him or it's a pencil. Always nice to see. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks. David, I combo, I haven't seen you in such a long time. You're looking well. <laughs> Hi, Arun. <laughs> I, I, I neglected to say that I'm interested in higher education in Africa. So if you're in uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Ghana, Senegal, um, Ivory Coast, you might see me wandering around <laughs> if you as ever... soon as the pandemic is over. If you ever need a city guide, I'm sure you'll find many people here in the group would be happy to, to accompany Great. you. Okay, th Great. thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.